that nice? It was lovely. <clears throat> this morning I'm going to be talking about an interesting subject. It's called the importance of spiritual independence. Before I get into the talk, I have a little introduction. And this introduction is a response to my blog that I posted an introduction to this whole subject of spiritual independence about over the weekend. And I wanted to share this response to the blog because I it, it really touched my heart and uh, showed that someone is reading the blog <laughs> and that it touched them and it made them think in this way. Uh, I think the young woman that wrote the response, I was trying to remember, she either lives in Mississippi or Louisiana, or one of the two, and I'm sure she'll tell me later by email. Anyway, this is what she says. Dear Jolene, every word freedom from my earliest teen years was thrilling to me. I surely wanted to go to San Francisco with flowers in my hair once I heard that beautiful song. Dylan's lyrics to dance beneath the diamond sky with one hand waving free, silhouetted by the sea, was another banner of freedom to this writer. She said, songs of peace, love, brotherhood, and freedom inspired and spoke to our souls. She wrote, Richie Haven sang freedom at Woodstock, and it expressed our deep longing we were all searching for freedom, freedom from the, from the establishment, freedom to end a war that made most, no sense, the freedom this Aquarian energy promised. James Taylor, beautiful, his beautiful voice sang, but I can hear a heavenly band full of angels, and they are coming to set me free. I don't know nothing about the why or when, but I can tell you that it's bound to be, because I could feel it, child, yay, on the country road. We had pieces of the puzzle, but we couldn't find enough to put it all together. We did not get ourselves back to the garden, as Joni Mitchell sang. Jackson Brown sang about the letdown in The Pretender. Bob Marley hit on a key in his redemption song, emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. So I love your beautiful post she wrote on spiritual independence. With the teachings we are given an understanding of what true freedom is, a soul lighting the way. And that was the result of just one sentence out of the blog, which was an independence. In independence, we try to manifest the beauty that is within us without letting other people hinder the process of manifesting our beauty. And then she says, and yes, the big one, freeing ourselves from our own limitations. Isn't that wonderful? And I just thought that would be such a wonderful introduction to the talk this morning. So alive, so real. Spiritual independence is a goal. It is a goal. It is something most of us are working toward or desiring once we know that it is possible. And you could tell in all the music, the words of these composers, their desire, their yearning, their longing to be free. That beautiful song in itself. To be spiritually independent means, in part, to do our best to be independent from the limitations that we have in our personality life. For example, freeing ourselves from negative emotions, which I'll talk about a little later. There are a myriad of other things as well, but negative emotions is a big one that we need to remove from our lives. 
When we become spiritually independent, we are going to be a soul lighting the way. Soul independence is an urge in you, in me, in the soul of every person to be free and to prevent any imposition of the will upon our life. And this is another point that I would really like you to, to put in your notebook, put in your journal, put it in your mind. We don't want to live in an environment where others impose their will upon us. When others impose their will upon us, we become dependent on them. We become uh, almost like an automaton. We become afraid to be ourselves. And perhaps the most critical response or reaction to being around people who, or media, uh, or nations that impose themselves upon us is we lose our creativity. Creativity comes from the impulses of the greater self, the higher self, also from our solar angel, also from the master. Creativity comes from so many different sources of inspiration. But when we live under or in an environment where our environment is short-circuited because of the imposition of will upon our life, then it's like we shrivel up, you know, into nothing. So I really want you to think about this. You're going to recognize immediately, once you become, become aware that imposition of another person's will is not appropriate to life or certainly to yourself, then you're going to really think about it the minute you recognize someone is imposing their will upon you. And then you're going to be challenged, what are you going to do about it? White Mountain, the White Mountain Education Association, has a prisoner's outreach program, a study program which includes men and women in prisons all over the United States. We recently received a nice long letter from one of the men who was explaining how the prison guards would not allow him to be independent. He said they do not want any one prisoner to stand out from the rest. He felt he had lost his individuality. This was his understanding of independence and individuality. To do what he wanted to do and not have to cooperate with the prison system. I think this misunderstanding of being an individual and having independence is pretty common. Now, this strange ex another strange example came into my mind. This is an example that happened to me when I was junior high school, so it was a few years ago. <laughs> I was in sewing class. I think it was a class I hated more than any class in my entire <laughs> life, <laughs> educational life. And uh, we had to make this pair of pajamas. And I wanted to make the pajamas the way I wanted to make them and with the colors that I wanted to use and the fabric that I wanted to use, even though I didn't like sewing. So I was trying to make something wonderful out of it. And then the teacher handed us a piece of paper of the rules. This is how you're going to make a hem. This is going, how you're going to make a flat felled seam. These, this is going to be the color of your fabric and so on and so forth. And uh, I was so disappointed and I so disliked the whole project. What I learned after this whole project was over is how smart this teacher was. 
She tried to make it easy for us and still produce a wonderful, beautiful product. After all these pajamas were made, then she said, now you have the rules. Now you can take these rules and be creative and do what you want. Just realize the rules are the foundation to making a beautiful pair of pajamas. That's spiritual independence. That's creativity. First, we have to create a foundation. So like this prisoner, he's not yet an individual. Without being an individual, without knowing himself, he's not going to be independent. So where he thinks he lost his individuality and lost his, indiv his independence, first he has to know who he is. What put him into the prison system? You know, so, for example, so we have all these rules now that prisoners must follow. And I'm not saying all these rules are you know, um, pristine, but, you know, they're better than not having any rules in which to create a foundation from which to live his life, where he can become an individual, where he can become free. And the same is true for all of us. To be independent, we must first become substantially free from our personality limitations. However, it is in being independent that we then learn how to be interdependent. It is like going from an individual to be part of a family, to be part of a group, to be part of a nation. All means interdependency. But we can't be interdependent without first being an individual or independent. It is in interdependency we learn how to cooperate and we learn how to eventually reach a point of harmony and balance. Spiritual independence is when you have the ability to prevent any imposition of will from others upon yourself, your group, as well as from the limitations of your own personality nature. We must be careful that others do not impose their will upon us. So now that we understand, at least in part, what spiritual independence is, we should keep in mind there is also a wrong independence. I know you knew this was coming, right? <laughs> I hope you knew that. For example, arrogance. Arrogance is an urge to be independent. But being spiritually independent has nothing to do with arrogance. In independence, we try to manifest the beauty that is within us without letting other people hinder the process of manifesting our beauty. If we understand that, it will be important. This is going to be an important step in the freedom of our soul, in the beauty, in the creativity of expression of our soul. So now comes the critical point of spiritual independence. And this is a quote. When we ourselves are walking on the path of independence, we must let other people be independent. And we must not impose our own will upon them. Any time we violate the independence of other people, we impose our image upon them. And we do not let them manifest their own original beauty. Independence is an urge that is inherent in our soul. It is a real urge within us. In fact, it is, an ur it is an urge in every seed of life. If you, for example, analyze how a seed grows, everything that the seed is doing is an urge for independence, to break out, right? 
The seed starts to break its walls and push away the things that are hindering its growth. Eventually, it manifests upon the earth and starts growing and growing and becomes, for example, an oak tree. The same seed of life is within us, within you, within me. You are going to be independent. We are going to be independent and eventually learn this through our independence. This is a very important point. So are you beginning to have an understanding now of what spiritual independence is? It's related to our soul. It's not related to our stubbornness or our um, desire to control other people and to say, I'm the path or I'm the way. Follow me and you make me happy. And if you make me happy, then you'll be happy. See, that's not what spiritual independence is about. And we know that. But when it gets down to the nitty gritty in our day to day life and in our relationships with one another, how are we treating one another? See, are we letting the beauty, the joy, the creativity, the freedom give birth to the nature of that person? Or are we always guiding them and telling them what to do and what not to do? And it goes down to the, the smallest little minuscule um, experience. And I can't tell you what it is because I have two more paragraphs to go. So, but, but think about this. <laughs> Because this is a great example, and, and I bet I want to wait a minute to get to the example. But I do want you to think about it in terms of your own life. How much control do you take over your children's life? Do you take over your spouse's life? Or how much freedom to grow do you give to them? As I said earlier, it is through independence you will also learn how to be interdependent, how to create right human relations, and how to establish harmony with each other, in which your independence and others are secure, and how to bring balance into your life. This is what symphony means. In symphonic composition, every note has its own place. Now, can you begin to see if we go back to the idea of the prisoner saying, you know, he had lost his individuality, but he had no individuality yet. He had no note, no sense of who he was or is. Where in a symphonic composition, every single note in that composition has a purpose. We could say has a heart and mind. And no other note imposes itself on the other notes. If they do, it is chaos. Have you ever heard all the instruments in an orchestra tuning up before they're ready to perform? It's horrible. It's chaos. Having been in that situation many, many hundreds of times, I couldn't even hear my violin to tune it to concert A. It was so chaotic because the winds were out there <laughs> <laughs> blowing the trumpets and their oboes and their flutes and their clarinets and everything. And then the little drummer in the back is going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> and they'd always get their ear down to the to this what do they call it, the skin on the kettle drum, and tr because they couldn't hear either, and they're, you know, moving around, trying to, trying to tune. Well, that's chaos. <laughs> and this is what happens when others try to impose their notes upon us, or if our own personality limitations try to control our divinity, our beautiful soul that is striving toward freedom. A real battle is taking place inside of us. 
the soul's strong desire for freedom and the various notes in our subconscious mind vying for control. We must strive to be independent from our limitations, the limitations we have in our personality. And we're, we're, we are given such an incredible guideline how to do that in the teachings. We're even told what these limitations are. They're called illusions, they're called glamours, they're called maya. And we have all of those glamours in written out in various books and what they're associated with. And we're told to take a look at them and begin to transform them. Yet are we doing it? And I say no. Now, I hope to make you mad enough. <laughs> say, I'm doing that. And then realize you're not. <laughs> but why aren't we? Because we're so comfortable in our skin. We're so comfortable with who we are that these limitations we see as gifts that demonstrate our personality and display who we are. So someday, maybe this would be fun to have a talk on glamours, just what glamours are, to really identify glamours and to identify illusions Okay, that would be a fun, fun Sunday to talk about. <laughs> so we must strive to be independent from our limitations. The, we might say, for example, I have an independent spirit. I'm fiery. That means I have an independent spirit. Okay, now here come the examples to disprove that idea. <laughs> for example, from the teaching. Most of humanity is dependent upon their sex. And they still say, I am an individual. I have spiritual independence. I'm a fiery spirit. But they're dependent on their sex. It controls them and it imposes itself on them. We are not independent, for example, from food. I'm already thinking about lunch. <laughs> <laughs> we must eat it. Jewelry is another thing. Now, yesterday, having been, you know, Valentine's Day, did your husband go shopping to Jared's? <laughs> what is Jared's? Well, if you're, I know some of you are listening to the webinar in another country. Well, this is an ad on television that shames every spouse, every boyfriend or girlfriend, that if you're partner doesn't go to Jared to buy you, you know, this most incredible, beautiful jewelry so that when you go to the next party, the other women are all looking, oh, look at your husband went to Jared's. <laughs> you know, the jewelry thing. Yeah, exactly. I mean, jewelry is another thing. If your spouse didn't go to Jared's, his goose is cooked. So these kind of things and others impose themselves upon us. When we turn on our television and radio or our cell phones and other devices with a myriad of ads that enter into our desired nature and impose things on us, such as the most recent ads, buy this special Android phone or this latest iPhone and you'll be ahead of all your friends. Or lately, there is a phone company ad that says, if you move over to them, your bill will be cut in half. Don't do it. That's so foolish. It's, it's like when you, the credit card companies send you these blank checks, you know, and for the first year, it's interest free. Don't fill out that check. It's going to, you know, you're going to pay for it dearly for years and years and years. Stick with your own cell phone carrier. Call them up and say, listen, there's this ad on TV. Can you beat this ad? Can you cut my bill in half? How can you do it? That's how you take the imposition of the media and turn it around to work for your benefit. See, that's independence. 
Real imposition makes you unable to decide for yourself. Independence lets you decide for yourself. For example, if this is necessary for my body, I will take it. And if it is not necessary, I will not. The other day, a friend was telling me about a family member who is battling cancer. Her blood platelets were so low that she could no longer complete her series of chemotherapy. So she decided to look into alternative therapies. Her sister interviewed two doctors who practice both alternative and AMA, or traditional medicine. Then the sister gave her findings to the sister, telling her, now it is your decision. Do you see? Yet my friend was giving her sister an opportunity to decide, to first listen to her own body, and then make a decision that was right for her. To be spiritually independent, soul independent, you must be dependent, independent, I'm sorry, you must become independent from all the factors that are limiting you and hindering your freedom. Okay, so let me talk a minute about negative emotions. We must begin the process of freeing ourselves from negative emotions. We cannot be an independent person if our emotional states control us. That's just a fact. For example, you have a fight with your wife or your husband, and that fight is going to control your behaviors over the next few hours or even over the next few days. Let's say you're a boss or a leader, and someone comes to you. This is after you've had this argument with your spouse or your friend, and someone comes to you as the boss and says, do you mind if I leave work early today? And the boss says, no, you cannot only leave early. I need you to stay later. <laughs> so you're still in that environment of that anger, that argument that took place between you and your partner. And you're, that's the negative emotion that's controlling you all afternoon into the next day and affecting other people. Or your boss gives you a hard time at work and you go home and you give your husband a hard time at dinner. Can you relate to any of this? <laughs> Most of your relations are controlled by other people imposing their own negative emotions upon you. Your judgments, your decisions, your choices cannot really be yours if you are influenced by your negative emotions or by the slander or gossip or criticism of other people who come and whisper into your ear and control your actions and reactions and responses. The gears of these negative emotions from the teachings tell us are hatred and anger and fear and jealousy and revenge and slander. We must slowly declare independence from these emotional gears. If we do not declare in independence from these emotional, but also physical impositions, our soul is not going to experience freedom. We are not yet free. We're not yet independent. We're not yet an independent person. And yet, you know, with the, the introduction that, that I read from, from the young lady where I've lost it, but you, we can still see this music being same words, same kind of music being composed for today's society. Yearning to be free. The teaching is showing us 
how to be free from the limitations of our personality, how to recognize when others are imposing their will upon us so that we can be an automaton and live just like they live and lose our creativity, our beauty, our sense of future. As long as we have vanity and ego, we cannot trust one another. You cannot trust yourself. You cannot inspire people if all that you are doing is being motivated by your vanity, your ego and separatism and prejudices. We cannot be independent souls until we become independent from all the factors that are limiting us and hindering our freedom and our growth. Okay, in the little bit of time that we have left, let me share some factors from the teaching <clears throat> about being spiritually independent. And here's a little story I wanted to share earlier. Living life with faith or living life in faith. Either way works, in faith or with faith. For example, when I was a mother for the first time and saw my child take his first wobbly step toward learning how to walk, I nearly fainted. I ran over to him to help him so he wouldn't fall. Like, where was my faith, right? After a few times, I finally found my faith in him, and standing back, I let his hand go so he could learn how to walk on his own. He would fall down in the next several days, but he would also quickly jump back up again and again, and he wasn't hurt. He was so excited, and I finally could breathe again. <laughs> We must do this with our friends as well, with your students and with your family members. You try to help them gain their independence so that they can stand on their own two feet. Now this is the toughest. You're going to let them fail. Let them be defeated so that eventually they discover the road of independence. Dependency slowly makes you hate dependency. This is what is happening when you reject each other and certain things because we don't want to feel imposition upon us. Here's another point. Independence creates striving. It truly is the impulse of striving. When we are independent, we're going to say, wow, now I'm going to do something. One summer when I was a young woman, I attended a most beautiful camp in Minnesota. During the summer, I decided to earn a swimming badge. To do that, I had to swim three miles in a cold lake and also tread water in this lake for 30 minutes. The test for treading water was, it came as a big surprise. I thought it would be easy. You're just, you know, you're just floating, you know, for 30 minutes, right? No problem. Well, what they didn't tell me until the day I got in the boat, the coach took me out in the middle of Whitefish Lake. This is a huge lake in Minnesota. And said, okay, jump out of the motorboat, and I'll come back and get you in 30 minutes. Oh. Exactly. And did I mention it was raining? <laughs> <laughs> so there I was, 14 years old, in a cold Minnesota lake in the rain and expected to survive with no help. <laughs> well, obviously I did, you know, because <laughs> I'm here today. And I got the badge, and boy, you can imagine a 14-year-old having accomplished something like that. You know, I did it. Now I'm going to do something. Hey, that's the independence. Now the coach could have stayed in that boat 
and just talk to me during the 30 minutes, you know, in the rain and in the cold water and in those fishy waters. You know? <laughs> but that's, that wouldn't have worked. Now, I imagine somewhere that coach was still available, but I didn't know. And I didn't see him to this day. I still don't know where she went. When we start developing striving, striving is to put all of our powers, energies, and forces into action to support ourselves. What happens when we put all that we have into action? We start developing faith in ourselves. This is very important. Everybody thinks that they have faith, but I don't think they really do. Faith comes to us a moment when we are totally abandoned. That's when you really know if you have faith in yourself, in your soul, in your independence with what you can do. Faith comes to us when we are totally abandoned. You start looking into yourself and you say, what am I going to do now? You then learn that you yourself can do something. You can remember when you were 14 in that cold water and that rainy day and what you did. This is like we're told in joy exercises. If you are lacking joy, go to that book called Joy and Healing and begin to go through exercises where you remember your joy when you're when you're a child, when joy comes so easily to most children. It's the same idea. If you have had these experiences, then you know what I am talking about. But first, you must be totally abandoned. These are tests, what I call abandonment tests, that will teach us to have faith in ourselves. The more faith we have in ourselves, the more spiritually independent we're going to be, free from the limitations of our personality life. Your mother has let go of your hand and allowed you to learn how to walk on your own. <laughs> freedom, the philosophy of freedom is the best philosophy in the world, but too often it is used in the wrong way. For example, we say we want independence and we want to keep our independence to make others dependent upon us. But this is wrong. When you are independent, you're going to work to make other people independent. Master Moria said something very beautiful. He said, Quote, pouring buckets of water on the wheel of the mill will not make it grind the wheat, unquote. So I had to learn what a wheat mill is. I mean, growing up in Iowa, we saw a lot of those, but I didn't really know anything about it. So I Googled, you know, wheat mills. And this is what I learned, that there's a big wheel that turns, turns to grind the wheat right? And it's always in a river. Have you ever realized that? Yeah, it's always in a river. The wheel is located near the mouth of a river, and the river comes like a waterfall and turns the wheel. Then the wheel turns, but there are big stones. It's not the water that is grinding the wheat. It is the stones. It's the wheat seeds. Wheat seeds, there's got to be a better word. Anyway, I like that. Wheat seeds <laughs> that, you know, with the water and the mixture, the grinding of these rocks working against one another that turn out the grain. Now, Master Morris said you could not grind the grain just by putting buckets of water on the wheel. So I see the water as the water of life. See, and the stones that are grinding the seeds to make the grain is like fire by friction, you know, striving and so forth. Uh, 
Okay, in conclusion, <laughs> the spirit of right independence eradicates totalitarianism, tyranny, and imposition. The spirit of right independence. So let us all walk the path of spiritual independence to live a life and let others live a life of soul independence. Oh, here's her. Ricky Haven. I don't, Richie Havens. I don't remember Richie Havens. You probably do. Yeah. He's saying freedom at Woodstock. I was busy having babies back then. <laughs> anyway, it was a fun lecture to give this morning. <laughs>